If you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can turn to 1 John chapter 4. As we continue in our series, Children of Light, Learning to Live as the Beloved. 1 John chapter 4, we don't have much to cover today, but I'd like to go deep into it. We're only going to be in a few verses, verses 17 through 21. 1 John 4, 17 through 21. I'll read and then we'll go to the Lord in, in prayer. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves, excuse me, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this word for its magnitude in our lives. Help us to understand what it means that perfect love casts out fear and help us to embrace it as real truth so that we might live in a way that pleases you, so that we might love you and love others without the fear that often holds us back. This we ask in the name of the fearless one who showed perfect love, Jesus, your son, amen. I wanna open with a quote from Aldous Huxley. If you've ever heard of A Brave New World, he was the author. He wrote plays, and he was a philosopher in the early 1900s. And uh, I have it here on the screen. This is, this is a quote that I think is, is really great because it takes 1 John 4.18 and then flips it around and, and inverts that message. Love casts out fear, yes, but conversely, Huxley says, conversely, fear casts out love. You think that's true? Love casts out fear, but fear can cast out love? I think so. He says, and not only love, fear also casts out intelligence. Some of us have seen that happen in, in real life, haven't we? Fear casting out people's intelligence. It casts out goodness. It casts out all thought of beauty and truth. Fear is the opposite of love. And that's why perfect love drives it away, casts it out. Because like oil and water, they just don't mix. They're not compatible. Fear and love are not compatible. This being the love, agape love, that Paul wrote about and we talked about the last couple of weeks, 1 Corinthians 13, that sacrificial love that God has for his people, the love we are to have for one another. That sort of love is incompatible with this sort of fear, this unhealthy, repelling sort of fear. And I tell you that because the fear used here is the Greek word phobos, which is where we get the word phobia, it's not the fear as in reverence, like the Old Testament says, fear the Lord. That means revere the Lord or respect him. This isn't that sort of fear. This is the fear we think of in day-to-day -day conversation. If you say you're afraid of something, that's what we're talking about. It's normal, everyday fears. The fears like those we talked about moments ago during worship, the fear of not having enough, not being able to do enough, fear of not being accepted by others, those kind of fears, fear like actual phobias that many people suffer with. Some of you know what arachnophobia is. Anybody want to tell me? Spiders. Yeah, fear of spiders. What about acrophobia? Similar word, but different. Yeah, acrobats spend their time up in the air, right? Acrophobia is a fear of heights. What about bibliophobia? Some of you who never read your Bibles might have this. Bibliophobia. It's fear of books. What about gynophobia? Husbands in the room. It's fear of women. Um, it's just a joke. I got, okay, I got, nope, uh, apparently not a funny one either. <laughs> Claustrophobia, fear of confined spaces. I got one more that I didn't know. I had to look this one up, but I talked to somebody this week who said they were going to drive like 14 hours. And I said, why don't you fly? Some airfare right now is pretty cheap. And they said, oh, I won't fly. I'm afraid of flying. So I looked it up and it's terra merhanophobia. It's a PT, like pterodactyl, silent P, terra merhanophobia. 
is the fear of flying. Anybody in here have that? Afraid to be in an airplane? We know about phobias. We know phobos. We know what fear is. But what does fear do to us? It causes us to withdraw, to flee, to back off. This isn't just merely feeling something. It's feeling that evokes action. And that's why it's so important. That's why God could command, do not fear, do not be afraid. If fear were just an emotion, we couldn't stop feeling that, right? You can't just not feel afraid. But what if fear is an action verb? What if to fear, phobos, what if it means to withdraw or flee or to panic, which is in fact what it means in the Greek? Well, then it's a command that we could readily apply and and obey. Don't flee, don't panic, don't withdraw because of these things you, you are afraid of. God commands it all over the Old and New Testament, and yet many of us suffer with these unhealthy fears. Now, they may be rooted in healthy fears. The fear of venomous animals like spiders or snakes is in some way healthy. Fear of heights is in some way healthy. We don't jump into the Grand Canyon because you would die. There's some sense of health there, of of self-saving nature. But at the end of the day, we know there are unhealthy fears. There are fears, which clearly John is speaking of here, fears that keep us from doing what is most important. All along, John has been saying one big thing, love. Love God and love your neighbors. If the love of God abides in you, you will love your neighbors. He says it again here at the end of chapter four. If you love God, then you must love your neighbors. You see them, you know them, you can love them, and that's proof that you may have loved God, that you know God, even though you cannot see him. Over and over again, love, 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 love. He doesn't suddenly shift gears and say, but now I wanna talk about fear. He's still talking about love, but he's talking about the biggest hang-up that keeps us from love, fear. Throughout Scripture, fear is the opposite of love because by nature, love, agape love, is vulnerable. We see fear originate in the Garden of Eden all the way back in the beginning. You know the story. God created man and woman in his image, and it was very good. This couple this first human couple in the story, in the narrative of scripture, is placed in a place of paradise, a position of of good relationship with God. And they're told they can eat of any tree in the garden, but don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And lo and behold, they break that rule and they eat that fruit. And God says, don't eat it lest you die. Well, they don't die, at least not right away. But they kind of die. Because now the life-giving relationship they had with God is severed. And what's the first thing they do? It says that they heard God calling for them in the garden, but they hid because they were naked and afraid. And God says, why were you hiding? And Adam says, because we were afraid. Fear. Fear leads them away from the loving God into hiding. Then it leads them to blame one another for their problems. Fear is unhealthy. It it repels love. And so God says, I'll make clothing for you. I'll cover your shame. I'm going to save you. You don't have to be afraid of me. But to save you, I'm going to have to send you out of here into the world. And then God begins this redemptive process that leads to Jesus and ultimately to his return, which we still wait upon. That whole story began with fear began with sinful pride and, as a result, fear. Fear that caused us to hide from the loving creator God who made us, who knit us together, who loves us. Anything that causes us to hide from the loving God or to hide from others that we're called to love is unhealthy. And so John says that kind of fear, that phobos, that, that, that fear that repels love has to be overcome. It has to be removed, cast out. The things you're afraid of may not be removed, but fear itself, that withdrawing panic, that fleeing instinct, the fight or flight thing, that that flight has to be removed. How does that happen? Well, it's cast out. Cast out, another Greek phrase, is not all that common in the New Testament, at least in that usage. The, The cast out phrase is found most notably in the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus and Matthew and Luke's Gospels uh, well, in Luke's gospel, it's the Sermon on the Plain, but same idea. He, he talks about salt. And he says, salt having lost its saltiness or become impure, what good is it for? What usefulness does it serve? None, except to be cast out. It's the same exact phrase. One of the only places we see it. Jesus uses it. And he uses it about something that is now absolutely worthless. Luke's gospel says, not even to be thrown in the manure pile. 
but out on the street to be trampled underfoot. It has no purpose whatsoever. And now we see that phrase again from one of the disciples who would have heard Jesus preach that sermon, and he says, you know what else is useless and ought to be thrown out? Fear. Fear. Because if we're talking about love, we have to overcome fear. What do we mean by that? Well, I think of Jesus. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. And the three temptations are really the three categories that all human fear is rooted in. I, I'm stealing this from Henry Nguyen, who does such a beautiful job explaining it, but, but I think it's profound. Jesus is tempted in three categorical ways, what he could have, what he could do, and what people would think of him. Not in that order, but he's tempted. He goes out in the wilderness, and he's hungry, and the enemy says, the accuser says, couldn't you turn stones into bread? Aren't you Jesus? And, and he says, yeah, but I don't live by bread alone. God is enough. My relationship with God is enough. I don't need stuff. I don't need to turn bread into stones. Then he's tempted again. Why don't you jump off the pinnacle of the temple in front of all these people, all these worshipers, and they'll see angels catch you and keep you from hitting the ground, and they'll praise God for you, and they'll worship you. They'll say good things about you. They'll think a lot of you. And Jesus says, I don't care what they think of me. I'm not afraid of their rejection. God loves me. And then he's tempted one more time. He's taken to this high mountain and the enemy says, look at the kingdoms of the world and all that they possess. I'll give it to you. It can all be yours. Think of what you'll have. It'll make you so important. All that stuff, all that power. And Jesus says, I don't need any of that to feel important. I'm loved by God. How did he overcome those temptations? How did he overcome those human fears? The very temptations that we succumb to every day don't we? Trying to have more, do more, be more appreciated or liked. How did he overcome those fears? And the answer is what happened right before the temptation. He was baptized in the Jordan River. And if you remember the account in the Gospels, the Holy Spirit descended and the voice of the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This is the beloved one. Jesus understood that as the beloved one, as the beloved one, he didn't need to do anything, to have anything, to prove anything. He was loved simply because he was the father's son. And then he goes out and tries to tell the world the same thing. You are children of your father. Don't be children of your father, the devil. That's what Pharisees are doing. They're trying to have more and do more and prove that they're better. But that's not it. You are already a child of God. Learn to appreciate that he loves you because he loves you because, as he said earlier in 1 John, God himself is love. He is love. He can't help but love you because he is love. Jesus understood what it meant to be the beloved, and so he lived as a child of light, as the perfect human. He loved, but his love was not without reason to fear. His love was, in fact, vulnerable and often rejected, and he suffered and he died. And so when I think of Jesus, I don't think of one who loved perfectly and lived a happy life. I think of one who loved perfectly despite an unhappy life. Because that's the nature of love. This kind of love, agape love, the love John is talking about here, is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. I want to look at another quote, this time from C.S. Lewis' book, The Four Loves. If you've not read it, I highly recommend it to you, The Four Loves. And speaking of agape love, this sacrificial love, this is what Lewis says. This is the love God has for you and the love you're supposed to have for one another. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Think about that. To love at all is to be vulnerable, at least in a fallen world. Love anything and your heart will certainly be broken. Anybody here ever had their heart broken? Feel betrayed, hurt by those you love? If you want to be sure to keep it intact, if you want to protect your heart, keep it safe. You want to live in fear. You must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Next slide, please. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglement. Lock it up safe in the casket. Safe, dark, motionless, airless. It will change. What does he mean? What do you think he means by that? Take your heart that thing from which you love, 
and lock it up safely. He means when you are afraid to love God and love others, when you're afraid to become vulnerable, the life you thought you were protecting becomes death. Without love, there is no life. And Lewis began to understand that later in his own life. And he realized that the message of Jesus isn't just to repent of sin, but to become as he is. That's what John says here. He says, if you are the beloved, then you will be as the beloved one was. You will be as he is in this world, or as he was. So here's what I'm telling you. John, a couple of weeks ago, told us that when he comes again, we will become as he is, meaning we will be glorified. But now, he says, before that happens, you have to be as he is in this world. Before you're ever glorified, you will become like Jesus now. You'll see evidence. It's the root of our assurance that we are becoming like Christ, that his love abides in us, and he abides in us. How do we know? Because we love one another. John isn't suddenly taking a rabbit hole trip talking about fear. He's still talking about love. But the enemy of God's love is fear. And he says Jesus overcame fear. He cast it out because he knew that he was the beloved. The emphasis is that the same could be true for you. How did, how did this unfold in the life of Christ? Where do we see it? I think most notably at the cross, right? But there were, there were four warnings. Not only did Jesus say he was going to be crucified, and that was his act of love, but he, he kept doing this one thing that I find remarkably important. When he fed thousands, it said he took bread, he blessed it, he broke the bread, and he gave it to them. And the multitudes were fed. And then at the Last Supper, it says during that Passover feast, he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And then the disciples on the road after Jesus' death not knowing about the resurrection. They were hopeless. And Jesus went in to eat dinner with them at their house. And it says, and finally he took bread and he broke it. He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him as Jesus. And then the early church goes on to take bread and bless it and break it and give it again and again on every Lord's day. And to this very day, we do it, we do it here every Sunday, just like they did in the book of Acts. We take bread and we bless it and we break it and we give it. But that was always just a picture of love because Jesus said of himself, I am the bread of life. And I hope you understand by now that you're not just eating bread when you take communion. You're recognizing the very person of Jesus, that he was the bread who was chosen and blessed and broken and given because that's what love looks like. It is by nature vulnerable. But for some reason, we don't recognize that. We don't think that's what love is going to look like. When we love, it's not going to be like that. There's not, not going to be that pain, the suffering, the anguish. We won't have to pray and sweat drops of blood in the garden. We won't have to suffer or carry a cross. And yet Jesus said that that's exactly what we would have to do. But we don't want to do that because we're afraid. We're afraid. Jesus spoke about this in the Gospel of John. The same John who wrote this letter to the church wrote a gospel, the Gospel of John. We've read from it almost every week. I want to read from it again. John 14. Jesus talking to his friends. He says, beginning in verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. That's what we want, right? We want the peace of God. That, that's the word shalom. It means wholeness, restoration, and quite literally peace. Everyone in one accord getting along the way it ought to be. Basically, salvation, I want to give to you. I leave it with you, but not as the world gives. I'm not giving it to you temporarily. I'm not giving it to you with strings attached. I don't give this to you, and I'm going to take it back later. I'm just going to give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them what? Be afraid. Don't be afraid. There's that command again. Next slide, please. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I will come to you. So Jesus is preparing them that he's going to the cross, that he is chosen and blessed, and he's soon to be broken and given. And he's saying, don't forget, that's what love looks like. I've told you I'm going away, but I'll come to you if you loved me, if you love me, meaning if love had been perfected in you, which is what John is still talking about in 1 John 4, if love had been perfected in you, you would have rejoiced. You would have recognized that this is what love looks like because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. 
And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. I've told you, I've shown you, this is what love looks like. So that when it happens, you know, this is my love for you. This isn't the end of the story. It's only the beginning. Next slide, please. I'll no longer talk much with you. I think Jesus was insinuating there's not much left to say. You're going to have to see it for yourself. I won't talk a lot with you anymore, but the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. And then he gives this invitation to follow. Rise, let's go from here. That last little quip from Jesus, I think, is a powerful invitation. Come and do this with me. Learn what it means to love and to be unafraid. That's what love looks like. Jesus is the bread who is blessed and broken and given. And so he invites you as his people to become the bread that is blessed and broken and given because that's what love looks like. It's not afraid to be broken. It's not afraid to give itself away. Love is by nature vulnerable and it never succeeds in the presence of fear. But when it is true, when God perfects his love, it casts out fear. It overwhelms fear and it fulfills its good purpose. And the love of God will succeed. So verse 17 told us to be as Jesus in this world, meaning to learn from his example, to love the way that he loved, to overcome fear the way that he overcame fear, to allow his perfect love to cast it out. And then verse 18 tells us that that's what will happen. His perfect love will drive away the fear, cast it out, throw it away. And then verse 19 tells us that we need to start moving in, initiating. We love because God first loved us. The nature of that kind of love is initiating. I've used that phrase a lot in this sermon series because it's something that I never really understood before. I've sort of always thought that it's just my job to love people whenever I have the opportunity. But Jesus says you have to make the opportunity. It's your job to find ways to love people. God didn't wait until he had an opportunity to love you. He made the way. He loved first. And he loved not knowing or perhaps in God's sense, already knowing that some would not love him in return. And he still put himself out there. He still loved vulnerably. It's hard to think of God as vulnerable, and yet he displayed it on the cross. When he allowed himself to be put in the hands of his own angry, sinful people, and then afterwards, when he offered that gift to anyone who would come, knowing that many would not. That's what love looks like. And that's not often how we love, because we are still afraid. We fear pain, we fear rejection, or as John says, we fear some sort of punishment. But the one who fears punishment hasn't been perfected in love. God's love is greater. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Mercy triumphs over judgment. How do we know that this kind of love abides in us? How, how do we have assurance that God's perfect love is, as John says here, being perfected with us? How do we know that we're those people? And he says, by loving your brothers, your sisters. The word is Adelphoi. It means brothers and sisters. It's a gender neutral term. It's just a way of saying people. If you love people that you see, then the love of God that you cannot see is in you. That's not really what we want to turn to for assurance, and yet that's what John offers here. It's not the only assurance we have, but it's one good piece, that if we learn how to love the people around us and overcome fear, then we know that the perfecting love of God is working in us, that the person I used to be afraid to reach out to and love, the person that, that makes me feel uncomfortable, the person that makes me feel like I'm at risk, that I'm being too vulnerable, to love that person is an act of perfecting love. It's God working in me. And it's my reminder that only God could do that because given my own tendencies, I would never do that. I wouldn't love the person who's gonna backstab me and betray me. I wouldn't love the person who may reject me. I can't even love myself because I'm not good enough. How could I ever love other people? So if I learn to love myself and love other people, then I know it's God working in me and I can give him the glory. John recognizes this that love is a God-ordained miracle. This kind of love comes from God. A 
I think we like miracles. The early church saw a miracle. There was, after the biblical era, in the next couple of hundred years, there was this massive case of dysentery in ancient Rome. It's worth a Google when you go home. Uh, but there's, there's a massive case of dysentery. And if you're not aware, uh, it's basically getting the runs until your body runs out of fluids and you die. It's really terrible. And they didn't have any cure for it, and they thought it was extremely contagious. So kind of like leprosy, they quarantined people and pushed them out of towns. And the Roman government didn't know what to do with all these people. They just kind of let them die on their own. But the Christians refused. The early church couldn't deal with that. And they said, we love these people. They're our neighbors, our family, our friends. We can't just watch them die. And so the Christians, many of them in house churches, brought people in, warmed them with fires, and gave them plenty of fluids. And lo and behold, many of them survived and came back into full health. And the world around that was watching said, it's a miracle. These Christians have something special. Little did they know it was just love. They didn't have a miracle cure for dysentery, except for warm fires and water. That's no miracle cure, is it? But the miracle was there. It was love. Because that kind of love is miraculous. To overcome fear. To stop caring about me because I care so much about you. That is a miracle. And where do you think they learned it? If not from Jesus Christ. We love miracles. Perhaps we've missed out on many an opportunity to be a part of one. Simply by loving without fear. It's one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. It's probably every preacher's favorite story. The prodigal son. How many of you have heard it before? Well, since a few of you didn't raise your hands, I'll assume you haven't heard it. It's more likely you just don't feel like raising your hands, but I'll recount the story. If you're not familiar, the prodigal son is a powerful story about a young man who wants to be emancipated from his family and go live on his own, take his wealth, his fortunes, as an early inheritance package. And so the father says, sure. He gives the son the money, sends him on his way, and that younger brother goes out and blows everything. He squanders his wealth on licentious living. And he ends up in a pigsty in the mud, and he wants to eat the food that the pigs are eating. He's given up all hope. And then this thought occurs to him. Maybe, maybe my father would still love me enough to let me be a servant in his house. Because even that, even to be a, a doulos, a slave, a servant, even to be a servant in my father's house is better than living in the mud next to a bunch of pigs. And so he, he decides, in a leap of faith, overcoming his fear of punishment, he decides, I'm gonna go back to the father, even though I know what could happen, even though I ought to be smacked and shamed and cast out, I'm going to assume that maybe he would let me be a servant. And he overcomes that fear and he goes home. Little does he know how much the father really loves him. Because if you know the story, by the time he's on his way home, the father runs out to meet him and hugs him. And before he can even apologize, the father kisses him and puts the signet ring on his hand and the robe on him. And he says, kill the fattened calf and throw a party. My son was dead and now he's alive. And the whole town celebrates. He had no idea how much the father really loved him. But to find out, he had to overcome his fear. I'm afraid there are many who are still in the pigsties because they're so afraid that the father couldn't love them that much, that there's no way he could forgive them for what they've done, that they haven't done enough, that they aren't enough, that people don't think enough of them. For whatever stupid reasons, they've convinced themselves that God's love isn't powerful enough to save them. And so they sit in the mud, hopeless. That's not all of the story, the prodigal son. There's an older brother, and he sits outside and pouts in outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of his teeth. And his story is the picture of hell. It's a figure of speech, of course, but he's missing the whole party, not because he blew it, but because he's still trying to prove that he is enough that he has enough, that people think enough of him. And that's exactly the speech he gives his father. The father comes outside and he says, Father, all these years, I'm going to paraphrase here, all these years I knew that you were, you were a hard judge. So I worked hard. I proved myself. Every day I worked for you and you never once threw me a party. You never cared. 
And the father says, son, everything I have has been yours all along. Now get inside and celebrate that your brother is alive. And then the story's over. And we're left with a cliffhanger not to wonder what happens to the younger brother, not to wonder what happens to the one with whom love has been perfected, who overcomes fear and embraces the love of the father. But we're left wondering what happens to the one who still thinks he has to be good enough to have a party, who thinks that the only way the father would love him and throw him a party is if he could prove he's lovable. And that is some of you today. All your lives, you have thought, I'm not lovable. I have to work harder. I have to do more. I have to prove something. He loves you, and he loves you because he loves you, not because you've done anything or earned anything or proven anything, but because he himself is love. Do you feel the freedom in that truth? And so John says, you've got to overcome this fear because fear has to do with punishment, and God isn't waiting to punish you. He's waiting to throw you a party. And in spite of all the times I've heard that parable, I still don't always get it. And I'm not sure I really believe it. Because the world doesn't seem to work that way. And because I'm afraid to be so vulnerable, to just trust the Father and think, okay, I'm going to lay it all before you, and I'm going to lay it all before everybody else. I'm just going to go love you and love my neighbors and just give my life away. I'm just going to let you take me and break me and give me away. No, it's much too much to ask. And yet that is love. But I'm afraid. Some of you are still afraid. The reason I hate that story, I love to hate it, I guess. The reason is because it doesn't end properly. The older brother should have had a party and the younger brother should have been punished. You all know that that's how it should have ended. That's how it should have ended. Because he needed to learn a lesson. Just like every one of you who has screwed up in your life, every one of you who has failed, who hasn't done enough, who isn't enough, you know that you're not enough. Every one of you needs to be taught a lesson. And so did he. But what kind of lesson do you learn at a party with the singing and the dancing and the feast? What kind of lesson do you learn when you come home after all of that and they just throw you a party? All I could come up with is, I'm so glad you're home. I've missed you, and I love you more than you know. What kind of lesson is that? Who needs a lesson like that? I'd imagine a lot of you. I know I do. I love you, and I've missed you, and I'm so glad you're home. For years, I thought that heaven was a prize that I was racing toward. And I've realized it's much more like just going home. It's, it's more than you could ask or imagine. It's love. Would you stand with me as we close? That Greek word, phobos, comes from phebomai. And its oldest usage that I know of is in the writings of Homer in 900 BC. Homer used that word in reference to those who were under-resourced and so had to flee from battle. They didn't have what it would take, and so they ran away. And ever since then, the word has been used often that way. And I think that's how John is using it here. He's calling us to love and to embrace God's love and to abide in God's love. And then he says, but some of you, I know some of you are going to run away because you don't think you have enough. You are under-resourced. And he says, God's perfect love can cast that fear right out of you. He can help you overcome. The one who fears punishment has not been perfected in love. I'll say that again. The one who fears punishment has not been perfected in love. Some of you this morning still fear punishment. Right now, you're thinking of other Bible verses to justify your fear. Saying, yeah, but somewhere, somewhere, I know it talks about hell and punishment. I'm supposed to be afraid. No, you're not. Not if you belong to Christ. Because perfect love casts out fear. And fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears punishment has not been perfected 
in love. It's my prayer this morning that you be perfected in love and that I be perfected in love. This morning, I want to offer not only an invitation to the Lord's table, but an invitation to each of you to embrace freedom for freedom's sake, to accept God's gift of love and allow it to shatter your fears and throw them away. This morning, as we open the trays and and you make your way forward, you will be invited to take of bread and juice, and you will be reminded that true love looks like taking and blessing and breaking and giving. But you also remember that all of that was done for you. You're not just called to imitate it, but to receive it. And some of you can't take these elements and then go and imitate it because you've never even received it. And so if there's anyone in this room who has not experienced the love of God, who is still living in fear, any of you who still think that you are not enough, that you haven't done enough, you haven't proven enough, that people don't think enough of you, if you are here this morning, I want to pray with you.